Uh, okay, so um, hi everyone. My name is Ines. I am a philosophy teacher. I'm an investigator at the Center of Philosophy of the University of Lisbon. I've been uh, working on the topics of landscape and war for quite a while now. Uh, it's a topic that really fascinates me. And today I'm going to be talking about the idea of landscape and war in Wolf and uh, Remark. Yeah. Okay. So there will be some content warnings, of course, unfortunately for this talk, there will be mentions and depictions of violence, mentions of children's death, depictions of death and decomposition of human and non-human lives. I'm gonna try to remember when the slides will come up and I'll let you know uh, before they show up. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about philosophy of landscape. So philosophy of landscape having achieved a greater recognition in the academic world only recently, it appeared before Joachim Ritter and Rosario Assunto in the texts of the German philosopher Georg Simmel that was born in 1858 and died in 1980, in 18, where we find landscape for the first time in a new conceptual terrain. And we can see Georg Simmel, of course, over there. Georg Simmel uh, wrote about many, many things, many topics, money, fashion, love, uh, society, and he talked about the idea of landscape as well, and he was the first one to put it um, in the terrain of philosophy. Landscape, after all, and with Zimel, will not be link, linked to an artistic creation through painting, nor will it be a piece of land, horizontal, visible from afar. Always connected with nature, Landscape is now thought at the beginning of the 20th century in philosophy as a category of its own. And Zimmel wrote about this phenomenon in his text called Philosophy of Landscape from 1913, uh, curiously uh, published in the year before the beginning of the First World War, the event that most destroyed the natural elements with a violence and destruction never before imagined or foreseen and which I also intend to explore here later. Being associated with nature, the landscape is questioned for the first time in philosophy, as I see it at least, as an intuition of an autonomous reality, impregnated by an ontological field that appears as new and special and which will matter uh, now perhaps more than ever as well, now in 2022, 2023, where we see again, destruction and war in Europe, for example, to understand, decode, and experience. In the terrible event of the First World War, we will find, I think, the peak of modernity. The human individual, mirrored in the examples of the novels that I intend to analyze here with you, taken to its limit in its humanity, creation, and destruction. The landscape I will try to show is sought by the human individual at the extremes of war and violence. The human individual of the beginning of the 20th century, portrayed in his maximum expression by the soldier on the battlefront, intends so many times in despair to undress his individuality. The final search for the landscape, which I understand to be portrayed in Virginia Woolf's Jacob's Room and Eric Marie Remarque's All Quiet on the Western Front, will then emerge as the ultimate bridge, the ultimate salvation, not just through like an aesthetic contemplation, easy, light, but as a difficult surrender that is intended to be total, synesthetic, and becomes ontological, existential. Surrendering to the landscape will not appear harmoniously, as we see. The phenomenon of war is not mentioned by Zimmel, Assunto, or Ritter, even though all of them authors of the 20th century, they leave the First World War, and also the Second World War, not Zemo. But all of them will write precisely about what I believe can be found with Jacob Flanders, Virginia Woolf's creation, and Paul Baumer, the protagonist of Eric Maria Remarque's 1929 novel. Through these stories, we see that nature, made into landscape is no longer just a flowery canvas or a poem from romanticism, but a plan that intends to be redeemed through human errors. For Georg Simmel, the landscape as a category of thought emerges derived from nature, a portion of nature. This part is very difficult to understand and I would need, I don't know, 10 hours to explain this part, of course, but I'm just like trying to 
categorize it very, very briefly. So for Gioximo, the landscape as a category of thought emerges derived from nature, a portion of nature. Seeing the landscape, we see the whole of nature. This reveals, however, contradictions. Insofar as we see the landscape as a picture of, la of nature, but in portions, with the contemplation of the landscape, quote, there is the synoptic apprehension of a reality that is not there, says Zemo, end of quote. The notion of landscape in Zemo is not a physical and limited object, being a way of apprehending the natural elements. More than the physical part, the landscape will be an anemic state, a feeling that Zimmel calls in German Stimmung. That means life, an impulse for life, uh, energy. Something that when contemplated, sends the contemplator's conscious to a special disposition for the sensation of the whole. An almost mystical phenomenon, we could say. This apprehension resides in the spirit, not in things. And the spiritual form of apprehension in, turns, in turn causes a conversion of a plurality of separate elements into a whole that appears as homogeneous. And that is landscape for Zemo. I know, very complicated to understand. So, you know, in such a brief way, with the German thinker Joachim Ritter that we see here on our left side, however, the main idea to keep from his philosophy will be that of an irrecoverable split between man and nature. And this will be essential, an essential position to retain in order to understand the steps that we'll take next and throughout this paper, this presentation, that will lead to my hypothesis of landscape as salvation. With Joachim Ritter, there is a progressive distancing between man and nature. The landscape in Ritter emerges as a compensation for the human individual who, no longer able to see the whole picture, everything, will notice in the landscape the organic and original lost past, the lost nature that we belong to. The landscape precariously feeling the human pain of knowing oneself to be already a separate being makes the experience of the human being with himself more bearable in the modern civilization that he himself created and which we will see in more depth later would be from the beginning impossible to escape. For Joachim Ritter, landscape will appear as a human production, uh, like a product of humanity, of the human individual. The landscape can only be seen, contemplated, felt, and experienced by an observer who is already epistemologically and existentially outside of nature. The landscape in Ritter follows the sensation that, of course, had already been described for the first time in philosophy by Zimmel in 1913, with the First World War about to start and change the vision that humanity will have about itself. The landscape is born, quote, when what pulsates in the intuition and in the feeling of life strays from the uniqueness of nature, end of quote, says Zimmel. In Ritter's philosophy, this sometimes unconscious search for the landscape appears in this way as a symptom of an illness. So landscape is a symptom. Landscape is, landscape is already a symptom uh, of an illness that is the separation, that is the essence of modernity, of humanity. Uh, the quest for the landscape thus accompanies this constant restlessness of modernity, of humanity with itself. So we belong to nature, we were one with nature and with individuation that we cannot, we cannot escape from it. Of course, as human beings, as human individuals, we long for that ontological base in which we were not yet an individual. And so through the landscape, as a creation of the spirit, we see that lost nature for a few moments. So landscape as a symptom, landscape as compensation for the lost past, a lost ontological past. The distance between the self and nature that Ritter describes in his essay, Landscape on the Function of the Aesthetic in Modern Society, it's an essay from 1963, will be after all, and as we, I understand it at least, a rift. If nature is the original primary base from which man comes, the individual is and will always be in the first instance nature. His nature, however, is in its genesis, as I was saying, a story marked by absolute disagreement. Man is condemned from the outset to an exit from nature itself, 
from which it will be impossible to escape. And this is the tragedy of culture that we talk about in philosophy. The return to this original background is impossible. The landscape then appears, and in my reading, as a simulation for man's encounter with his natural base, the whole of nature to which he belonged to. The landscape in Ritter's philosophy, and as I defend, is the unquenchable perception of this distant oneness that we were. I chose this image because, well, first of all, I really like the image, so I decided to put it. And <laughs> I, think, I think it uh, shows this thing that I was reading right now quite well. Quote by Ritter, the reification of nature into an object and with it the separation of man from the peaceful original nature is therefore not considered as a fall and loss of an existence still intact in its origin. The loss of the peaceful surrounding nature is above all the very condition of this freedom, the freedom to create that we cannot escape, the freedom to be human beings, we cannot es escape that. So there is in a just like a child that belongs to their parents, but uh, wants to get away from them, get away from them. And maybe later in life desires that connection again. I don't know, just a metaphor, I think. In Joachim Ritter's philosophy, landscape is a mental production of the autonomous and free human spirit. Like a created object that could never have not been created. It would not be natural not to miss nature. Quote, landscape is nature that becomes aesthetically present in the eyes of a sensitive and sentimental beholder. End of quote. The landscape emerges as a need of the soul that needs a solution. The soldier that will fight in the trenches experiences the landscape in a very special way, I think. The eye urges for a solution, sometimes final. The landscape will be this lost nostalgia of that distant past that was pure nature, where the human individual was not yet an individual, not yet a creator, but only a creature. And well, let's begin with Virginia Woolf's Jacob's Room. She says, she wrote this in her diary in 1918, one has come to notice war everywhere. Woolf, of course, uh, we all know it. I mean, you guys better than me, they're from literature and all of those uh, kind of things. She was born in 1882, she died in 1941 in a terrible way, as we all know. She was 40 years old when Jacob's Room was published and she said this, uh, she wrote it in her diary just out of curiosity. She said, Leonard, which was her uh, husband, she, he read my book and he says that it's the best book that I've ever written. And she also says, as I remember, if I remember correctly, she says, I think I am able finally at the age of 40 to say things in my own voice with Jacob's Room in 1922. So let's see a little bit of Jacob's Room. So four years later, after, of course, 1918, four years later in 1922 in the book Jacob's Room, Wolf will tell us that, quote, there is no denying the wild horse in us galloping intemperately, fall on the sand tired out, feel the earth spin, end of quote. In the impossibility of forgetting the war, which had ended but remains, however, forever present, there appears in the human being a rush, quote, a rush for stones and grass, as if humanity had ended, says Wolf in Jacob's Room. Uh, when I'm quoting Jacob's Room, I'm going to just put VW, which is Virginia Woolf, and I'm going to just put the chapter because uh, all of us use different uh, editions, so I'm just going to put the chapter to be easier. The story written by Virginia Woolf and published in 1922 is about Jacob Flanders. And now I'm going to like try to uh, do like a small, small synopsis of the book. We never really got to know or get to know Jacob Flanders, although we managed to see him in practically every scene of the narrative as a child we see his fascination with animals. We are introduced to his passion for Plato and the other Greeks in Cambridge, where he studies, hanging out in London with friends who have secret crushes on him. We see him being loved by women who he does not love back, working and traveling, but we know little about Jacob. Jacob's Room then is the fragmented story of the fictional character, Jacob Flanders, from his childhood to adulthood. 
The reader is offered no explanation for what happens to the protagonist who suddenly disappears at the end of the book. We can only suspect Jacob's enlistment in the British army and his consequent going to the front where he died somewhere between the fateful years of 1914 and 1918. Of course, his name, Jacob Flanders, is already like an omen of, I don't know, the end of the story, right, in Belgium. Contrary to what happens regarding the other characters of Wolf's novel, access to the thoughts of Jacob, the young adult who will die in the Great War, is restricted to us. There is in Jacob Flanders a subject that we do not know. The only signs of clarity regarding this character are revealed, I think, only when Jacob is present in the landscape, which, as I will try to show here, he seems to secretly and unconsciously desire. Away from Greece and Plato and all the things he studied. Wolf's book starts with Jacob Flanders' mother, Elizabeth Flanders, writing a letter sitting down on the beach. Jacob is a young child, so this is like late 19th century. So of course, quote, wrote Betty Flanders, pressing her heels rather deeper in the sand, there was nothing for it but to leave, end of quote. This is the sentence that opens Virginia Woolf's book. There was nothing for it but to leave. We also understand, and at the same time, an elderly man, the, the old painter, who tries to paint on canvas the landscape that appears to him. The painter's thoughts, which appear to us in the first person, tell us that although he started to paint late in life, as he mentions, he knows in landscape painting that it is important not to forget the painted, that painted landscapes, quote, always seem too pale and that they need a black and dark violet to become more vivid, end of quote. And quote again, he, the painter, struck the canvas a hasty violet black dab for the landscape needed it, end of quote. This strange idea of departure left in a letter by a maternal figure is immediately followed by a reflection on the importance of black colors in a landscape. And I don't think this is by chance. Perhaps an omen of Jacob's physical death in the trenches of the Great War. I believe the sadness of the abandonment of that Cornish beach landscape where the family is happy. It is equally an abandonment of a primordial safe and enchanted base. Both the beach and the original base seem to merge one and the other into the other. Jacob's physical death in the trenches of the First World War, suggested at the end of the book, appears in my view immediately, after all, at the beginning of the book. We realize uncomfortably that Jacob is already dead, even before he is a written character in the story we are reading. The vocalization and the pure, sad and solitary calling of his first name by his brother, Archer, who looks for him euphorically running along the beach at a still so early point in the story, I think it seeks to materialize in the air against the rocks, as Wolf writes it, what will already be an absence. Quote, and this is Archer, so the older brother of, of Jacob running, looking for him at the beginning of the story. And he says, Jacob, Jacob, Archer uh, shouted. Jacob, Jacob, Archer shouted. Jacob, Jacob, shouted Archer, lagging on after a second. The voice had an extraordinary sadness, pure from all body, pure from all passion, going out into the world, solitary, unanswered, breaking against rocks, so it sounded, end of quote. We can never fail to notice that Jacob, as I argue, is, present, is presented to the reader as immediately connected and intertwined with what we see as the landscape of the seashore, the beach, and their elements. The first time we become aware of the protagonist, of Jacob, who is unresponsive, unresponsive and will always be unresponsive throughout the book, we notice him emerging, as Wolf says, from behind a rock. The element of the rock will also be present later, and I will also investigate that episode with you guys later. For now, we see that, quote, rough, the rock with crinkled limpid shells and sparsely strewn with locks of dry seaweed. A small boy has to stretch his legs far apart and indeed to feel rather heroic before he gets to the top. But there on the very top is a hollow full of water with the sandy bottom, with a blob of jelly stuck to the side and some muscles, end of quote. 
this apparition and consequent symbiosis with the rock on the beach are not by chance again, I think. Well, the rock was one of those tremendously solid brown or rather block rocks which emerge from the sand, like something primitive, end of quote. The wild, solid and primitive character of the rock is confused with the boy. Jacob emerges from this rock as if he were an integral part of it without ever in fact really separating himself from this basic organic environment. The beach in Cornwall of that synesthetic and eternal childhood of Jacob Flanders is then the space of that fundamental, natural and infinite ontological place where Jacob exists in silent communion with everything he loves, still without separation, that is, without modernity, as I say with Joachim Ritter, without civilization, without Cambridge, where we will study. Living nature is leaving the seashore of Cornwall for Jacob. The skull of the sheep found by Jacob on the sand, part of that landscape, will be the last element mentioned by Wolf before the family leaves the beach on that gloomy late afternoon in September with a storm in the distance and which is approaching. Jacob picks up the skull to drop it immediately on his mother's orders. Jacob and the family move off the beach, Jacob, forever. The description that closes that first scene we are interested in dwelling on, Jacob's childhood beach scene, will be precisely that of that sheep's skull. And let us note that Wolf insists on describing it with an intensity that is not just circumstantial and then therefore I believe it's worth paying attention to. Quote, there on the sand, not far from the lovers, lay the old sheep's skull without its jaw, clean, white, windswept, sand rubbed, a more unpolluted piece of bone existed nowhere on the coast of Cornwall the sea holly would grow through the eye sockets. It would turn to powder, end of quote. The whiteness, purity, and incorruption of the skull found by the boy thus becomes a symbol of death and symbol of life that will fall apart. However, like all the other elements of the landscape that we feel and we play, renewing ourselves in the great orchestra that is the order of infinite things. It will dissolve in the sand and compose the sea in powder. The skull that rests there a morbid but reconciling sign as eternal, unique, divine characteristics. Quote, in the other bed by the door, Jacob lay asleep, fast asleep, profoundly unconscious. The sheep's jaw with the big yellow teeth in it lay at his feet. He had kicked it against the iron bed rail, end of quote. Jacob is sound asleep, even though the storm outside is raging and loud. His mother, Elizabeth Flanders, notes that Jacob finally brought the, she the sheep's skull home and that it is placed at the foot of his bed while the child sleeps in Elizabeth's eyes, quote, completely motionless, unconscious, end of quote. This is a strange and very frightening, at least for me, uh, image to see, especially in the circumstance in which the person observing it is Jacob's own mother who sees the skull of the sheep at the foot of the bed next to, his, to her son, who is lying as still as a dead body. Unconsciousness and liturgy will be two attributes continually associated with Jacob Flanders. The young Paul Baumer, the main character of the book All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remarque, published in 1929. Although Baumer undergoes an evolution throughout the story, recognizing himself already far from nature because he knows the orders of war, will be able to unfortunately glimpse in himself and his companions this cloudy and childish character that we read in Jacob's room about Jacob, the boy who did not exist. In the same way that Wolf puts Fl Elizabeth Flanders in the tragic position of being the observer of her son's deep sleep as a boy like a dead body, Paul Baumer, so the protagonist of this book, All Quiet on the Western Front, will repeatedly come across the vision, and here no longer metaphorical, but cruelly real, of thousands of dead men in war landscape. Here on the left, of course, we see a picture of Remarque on the left, Remarque that was born in 1898, died in 1970. And on the right, we see a picture of his book in the original, in German, of course, uh, Investe nicht Neues. And I don't speak German, but I think I did a great job saying the name. <laughs> and here, 
uh, it starts, you know, those those depictions. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front is a book that is quite graphic, and that was precisely the intention of Remarque. In the field, the young German soldier, so Paul Baumer, tells us, quote, my hands become cold and my skin crawls. However, the night is hot, only the fog is fresh, the sinister fog that creeps around the dead before us and sucks out the last drop of hidden life. Tomorrow they will be livid and their blood clotted, end of quote. On the right here, we see one of the posters for the movie All Quiet on the Western Front. It's a movie from 1930. Uh, it was directed by Lewis Milestone. Whoops. As it often becomes impossible to remove the dead after an attack, new attacks occur quickly. And quote, the corpses are scattered everywhere. It is as if the dead had been killed a second time, end of quote. As if this scenario could not be more terrifying, Paul Baumer describes in horror the faces of these very young soldiers from whom life, like Jacob Flanders, was so quickly and sinisterly torn away. Quote, their faces of the young soldiers, sharp, beardless, and dead, have that terrible lack of expression of the corpses of children, end of quote very terrible uh, things written there, of course, but very real. The same thing happens in Wolf's book. There are constant denials and non-presences of Jacob Flanders. Jacob Flanders finds himself surrounded by a dense and lethargic aura, as I said previously, as if he were asleep. And he becomes, in my view, of course, not just in my view, but in the view of uh, everyone that read these books, obviously, the expression of a generation of men who we will observe better later, having been sent to war, remain to exist. Their existence, as I try to show here, is not made up of individualities which have been lost, but of an ever persistent attempt of salvation through the memory of the landscape, through its experience in extreme cases, ultimate delivery, so giving themselves to nature. To landscape. We don't know Flanders' physical attributes, not even his psychological characteristics. A friend of Jacob, uh, it's a girl called Fanny Elmer, she talks about Jacob the same way Eric Maria Remarque writes about Paul Baumer. The lost generation, as they were known, as we know, is faded to disappear like smoke. And I'm going to read a quote from Wolf's book. This is Fanny Elmer talking. What a beautiful voice, Fanny thought, how little Jacob said, yet how firm it was. She thought how young men are dignified and aloof, and how unconscious they are, and how quietly one might sit beside Jacob and look at him, and how childlike he would be. And forever, the beauty of young men seems to be set in smoke. Possibly, they are soon to lose it, end of quote. This growing dissolution of Jacob's character and figure, once again, being a literary like, expression in Wolf's book, is categorically and bodily revealed in Remarque's book. Once again, it is Paul Baumer, the autodiegetic narrator, who, describing his personal experience on the Western Front of the First World War, finally tells us, it is, he still does not know it, the story of Jacob Flanders and his, where life stops. The annihilation of his figure and that of Jacob in an industrialized slaughter. We see people whose skull was taken continue to leave. I'm quoting from uh, Eric Maria Remarque's book, and this, this one is very graphic. We see people whose skull was taken continue to leave. We see soldiers run whose feet have been mown. They go red, stumbling to the first shell hole after the bloody stumps. A first-class soldier drags himself by his hands for two kilometers with his knees broken. Another arrives at the aid station with his guts slipping from his hands, struggling to retain them. We see people without a mouth, without a lower jaw, without a figure. We found one who, for the space of two hours, keeps his teeth clenched on the artery in his arm so as not to lose all the blood. The sun goes down, night comes, the shells whistle, life stops. The small piece of land carved up where we are now has been preserved. 
despite superior forces. But for every meter, there is a dead person." End of quote. Ignorance of the future and misunderstanding of the present, where the mutilated land receives the bodies of these young people, are irrefutable constants. Only the landscape elements, however, seem to receive a different light of hope, understanding, and redemption, to which I believe the two authors, um, Wolf and Remarque, the two authors that I'm presenting resort to without sometimes, I think, really realizing it. And let's see uh, uh, a scene that I think it's interesting. Jacob is, asked, is after his butterflies as usual, says Wolf. Jacob Flanders will collect butterflies. The boy will remain in the street after sunset, hidden patiently in order to manage to capture the red butterflies that would fly over the gardens during the night, keeping them in a box, which curiously will smell like seaweed. I don't know from the Cornish beach, maybe, an extension of Jacob, the beach, which it is important to note, does not seem to abandon the boy throughout the book. The collection of butterflies, it is interesting to note, will be an activity that Wolf's character will share with Paul Baumer, Remark's protagonist, and that will be revealed to us in the final chapters of the book when the young German soldier briefly returned home due to a leave of absence confesses his apathy and sense of separation in relation to everything that used to be so close to him. Quote, here I have my mother, my sister, my box of, of butterflies, but I still don't feel completely at home. There is a veil and a gap between me and things, end of quote. Remark proposedly places the central character of the book to tell his own story. The narrative action of All Quiet on the Western Front, being the singular story of the German soldier Paul Baumer in the trenches of the Great War, becomes in truth, as we know, the plural story that was the portrait of the young man, the lost generation, who, thrown into a war they did not choose, choose, however, and always, the landscape, in perdition, in horror, in speed, and in death. In a book that will be censored and burned in Nazi Germany from 1933 onwards, Eric Maria Remarque's intention is clear and distinct from the first page. And this is the first page of the book. When we open it, this is what shows up. Quote, this book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all an adventure, for death is not an adventure for do to those who stand face to face with it, this book will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped shells, they were destroyed by war." End of quote. Let's read another passage from All Quiet on the Western Front. Two yellow butterflies play all afternoon in front of our trench, says Paul Baumer. The wings are spotted red. What would have drawn them here? There isn't a plant, not a flower around. Birds are so careless. Every morning, the larks fly between the enemy fronts. For a year now, we have been able to observe them about to lay their eggs and even manage to raise their children, the little birds." End of quote. This is an image from the 1930 movie, All Quiet on the Western Front. It's also a very beautiful image, I think. In the very uh, Kantian, idea of beauty as a symbol of moral good. The landscape mirrors this ordered, cyclic, metatemporal, metaspatial unit, which snatching up the poetic subjects welcomes them. The contemplation and experience of the beauty of the landscape, as I believe Wolf and Remark show us, leads us to goodness, correctness, right. In the phenomenon of war, where there is no place for good, the beauty of the landscape in destruction, vertigo, and violence has in itself the unique ability to rescue and reflect justice and clemency in a particular way. There are several evocations and notes of death and disgrace. The landscape is repeatedly drawn on a joyful and infinite note that will, however, and invariably fall into a solemn and heavy note that, too, is infinite. As if in this infinity, there was a constant reminder of finitude, mortality, and the end of things. So there's a very scatological uh, realm of, of landscape or 
stadium of landscape. The presence of death, therefore, constitutes a core dimension in understanding the landscape phenomenon, at least I think. Already a young man, Wolf will describe Jacob's summer in the Isles of Scilly. I did not know where the Scilly Isles were, so I went to Google, and apparently it's a small archipelago located off the southwest part of the United Kingdom. I think that's it. Being July and the scorching sun, quote, the seat in the boat was positively hot and the sun warmed Jacob's back as he sat naked with a towel in his hand, end of quote. Jacob Flanders baths naked in the icy water surrounding Scilly with his friend, Timmy Durrant, watching him. Jacob's naked dives into the sea in a deep and footless area are also described in a tangle of colors, tones, and movements. The water, which seemed calm and clear with blue and white waves, suddenly, writes Wolf, becomes purple in color, like a bruise. Jacob, that is swimming peacefully at first, is out of a sudden having difficulties, breathing hard and swallowing water involuntarily. Quote, the Isles of Scilly were turning bluish and suddenly blue, purple and green flushed the sea, left it gray, struck a stripe which vanished. But when Jacob had got his shirt over his head, the whole floor of the waves was blue and white, rippling and crisp, though now and again a broad purple mark appeared like a bruise, or there floated an entire emerald tinged with yellow. He plunged, he gulped in water, spat it out, struck with his right arm, struck with his left, was stowed by a rope, gasped, splashed and was all on board." End of quote. In the characterization of the coastline of Cornwall that can be seen from the place where Flanders is swimming, quote, the mainland, not so very far off, you could see clefts in the cliffs, white cottages, smoke going up. They had an extraordinary look of calm, of sunny peace, as if wisdom and piety had descended upon the dwellers there. And as if the end of the world had come, let's see this part carefully, and cabbage fields and stone walls and coast guard stations, and above all, the white sand base with the waves breaking unseen by anyone rose to heaven in a kind of ecstasy, end of quote. Once again, we see that this fantastic dimension of the ontic and temporal landscape, however, will necessarily have to welcome another side that is less luminous, but which projects the true, inclusive and organic nature that is the cycle of birth and death. After all, quote, imperceptibly, the cottage smoke droops. It has the look of a mourning emblem, a flag floating its caress over a grave. The gulls, making their broad flight and then riding at peace, seem to mark the grave, end of quote. If in Virginia Woolf's book, there are multiple metaphorical allusions to tombs, death markings, or holes excavated in the earth when describing the landscape, in Eric Maria Remarque's 1929 book, we also find a dark and gloomy scenario, way darker and way more gloomy. And uh, so this next slide can be a little bit um, heavy. The landscape of death and life in the trenches of the Great War is explicitly seen in a particular passage of the German writer's book. It's a passage that I really, really love, but it's very hard. Blinded by beams of lights and explosions, which happen in the frightening field, it will be in the death, literally the death present in that landscape to get life that Paul Baumer will hide. Quote, the plains are flat and the woods are dangerous. There is no other shelter than the cemetery and its tombs. We go there stumbling in the dark. Each one of us sticks to a mound of earth. The darkness becomes mad, shadows blacker than night rush towards us, angrily like gigantic humps and then passes by." End of quote. So there's corpses, the corpses that had been buried there in the past, already decomposing, now serve as a shield under which the German boy tries with difficulty to cover himself during a bombardment in panic during a nocturnal attack. Quote, the land opens up before us. I groan, the earth crumbles, the air pressure roars in my ears. My fingers grip the sleeve of a coat, a human arm. Is it injured? 
I speak to him as loudly as possible, but there is no answer. It is a dead man. My hand probes further and finds pieces of wood. Then I remember that we are at the cemetery, but fire is stronger than anything. It nullifies the senses. I crawl further under the coffin. I need you to shelter me on earth, even if death is in the shelter. End of quote. In what will be one of the bloodiest and most terrible nights spent at the front, the landscape, tells us Paul Baumer, quote, is continuously in motion crossed by the flashes. Rockets rise, red and silver balls, which burst and fall in a shower of green, red and white stars, end of quote. It is still notorious, quote, the fog and the smoke from the cannons that cover the plain up to the height of our chest and the moon shines up there, end of quote. The space of the trenches of the Great War and its landscape constitutes an experience of the unreal and dystopian. The closure, the restriction experienced there became visible in many of the testimonies of real people who in those years fought on the various fronts of the First World War. What philosophy and literature here through the examples of Wolf and Remarque contain is a reflection of true sensations where the landscape open to infinity is salvation. Here we see, of course, a scene from the, the movie 1917 from Sam Minch. Some Minch that I think it's, uh, he's from, uh, uh, his grandfather was Portuguese uh, and, or great grandfather was Portuguese and, and he did this movie, I read in an interview that he, he did this movie in honor of his grandfather and also in honor of, of those men that died during the wars. And now let's see some examples, some real life examples. We read from the British writer Max Plowman, born in 1883 and that died in 1941. Max Plowman, that was one of the most famous soldier poets, a remarkable confession. It is during the fateful years of 1917 and 1918 that Plowman will write his most difficult memories about the landscape, the war, and life. We see Max Plowman there on the left. In Subaltern on the Somme, the book, a book published in 1928, that is over there. Plowman writes, quote, was it John Ruskin who said that the highest and most glorious alf of nature passes unseen by most people? The trenches change that. The landscape that closes in on us forces us to look at the sky and where there is blue with flakes of white clouds and when the ground below us is contaminated, we look up in wonder perhaps remembering the days when as children, we would lie in the gardens of houses, counting the passing clouds, end of quote. Just as Max Plowman points out the landscape and the sky that opens it up as salvation for those who live there, telling us in the first person the suffering experience at the front, the Italian philosopher Rosario Assunto over there on the right, that was born in 1915 and he died in 1994. Also masterfully defends in philosophy, the persuasive and appeasing character that the landscape starts in the sensitive subject. Renaissance painting of the 15th century, for example, in the discipline of aesthetics, seem to obey the same formulas as Asunto that guides the soldiers in a factual dimension in the landscape of war. Uh, Asunto does not speak about the war. This is me writing it. Uh, but I think I see this, he talks about Renaissance painting and we will see what he says after. Uh, and over here, so we see Rosario Assunto on the right and on the left, we see a translation of a book that is actually a big book uh, with many, many volumes. And it's called in, in Italian, it's called, if I remember, Il Paesaggio e l'Estetica. It was first published in 1973. In view of the fearful and violent scene that unfolds in the foreground, whether it is a question of Raphael's deposition of the dead Christ in 1507, or the vision on the battlefield of Flanders in the 20th century of motional, motionless corpses with the face of a child, as Remarque writes, our eyes seem to turn 
to a search for a serenity of the landscape and to the sky it's opening in particular. The sky as an opening of the landscape to infinity, as Rosario Assunto defends, is an idea that crosses the thinking of several authors. Joachim Ritter had also mentioned it when he refers, for example, that the sky, quote, being the epitome of air and light is the very image of infinity, the noblest and most essential part of the landscape, end of quote. The need for the immensity of celestial space in the face of the claustrophobia of the trenches. Well, here on the left, we see, of course, the painting from Raphael, the decomposition, the, the, see, the, the, the position of the dead Christ. And on the right side, we see a picture taken by the Portuguese war photographer, Arnaldo Garcês. Uh, it's a picture, of course, we can see of the destroyed landscape from 1917 in Flanders. We see a Portuguese soldier there resting, and next to him, we see the Christ of the trenches, uh, to which the Portuguese during the First World War would pray to. Just a curiosity, this crucifix was brought back home to Portugal, and today it can be seen in the monastery of Batalha, where it is protecting the tomb of the unknown soldier. So they brought back the, the Christ of the trenches. We can see it here, actually. Um, it was not restored as we see, it lost the legs, it lost the legs and part of the right hand, etc. It also has a bullet on the stomach next to the ribs. And over there it's a picture of him protecting the unknown soldier. Let's see another example. The time that the British baronet Philip Bilditch here on the left side corner, born in 1861 and died in 1948. So the time that the baronet Philip Pilditch spends in the landscape that is no man's land will be a morbid occupation. Pilditch also wrote about the disturbing testimony of the landscape at the front. The landscape welcomes as always life and death, redeeming it is however on its soil that the macabre parade of human bodies, putrefying animals, craters appear, Nature, swallowing and purifying these elements, lives with it, however, and in the landscape that mirrors it, the passing of the years. And this is what Pilditch says in his diaries. Quote, having spent four years in no man's land, it was a morbid occupation. Trace the various battles between hundreds of skeletons and bones. The progress of our attacks could clearly be seen by the types of equipment on the corpses. Soft cloth caps denote the struggle of early 1914. In 1915, scattered masks and respirators, then the steel helmets of 1916. The war landscape, and as we see, also has a distinctive psychological characteristic. If it is a meeting point between oneself and a distant natural base, as the philosopher Ritter would describe, if it is a space of remembrance and nostalgia of an indistinct belonging to nature as a whole, the landscape of the trenches in horror and extreme violence is still an understanding but fearful line that divides the known and the unknown, the place where man is safe for a moment and the place where he does not know if he will fall, the safer and the hostile, life where it still exists and death where it no longer exists. The fields in front of him which he sees, feels, and runs through with difficulty and so many times wounded as very particular characteristics in the war landscape. The defensive and offensive lines whose marks are still visible today in the landscape of Flanders, this is a very recent picture, um, aerial, of course, a picture of Flanders in Belgium. The defensive and offensive lines whose marks are still visible today in the landscape of Flanders, for example, constitute empirical signs of this delimitation of polarities between the known and the unknown, the own and the foreign, the comrade and the enemy. There is the ground already explored where the soldier stops and hides and what has not yet been investigated, which is silent and will belong to the enemy. So we can see uh, more than 100 years later, there's still signs of the war. Death, and uh, this part is going to be again uh, graphic, 
Death, as we have understood throughout this presentation, occupies a central place in the landscape of the Great War. This landscape ex exposes in the most disturbing way possible the brutality of contemplating and experiencing death. For Paul Baumer, the feeling of death running through him leaves him in a constant state of alert. I'm gonna read, quote, the front is a sinister whirlwind. When you are still far from the center in calm waters, you can already feel the sucking force that drags you along slowly, inevitably, without being able to oppose much resistance. It is the front itself. It is that landscape from which an electric fluid starts, which mobilizes unknown nerve fibers in me, end of quote. So it is the landscape that creates this these fibers that he feels. In addition to the bodies of dead men present in those nocturnal fields, and in addition to the disturbing event that is to seek a hiding place inside an old bombed out cemetery underneath old pine coffins, there will be for Paul Baumer another experience of death in the landscape that is absolutely unique. I'm gonna quote, the screams continue. It cannot be human beings who scream so terribly wounded horses. I had never he heard horses screaming and I can hardly believe it. It's complete agony. It's the martyred creature. It's a wild and terrible pain that moans like this. We become pale. And as if by chance the bombardment is almost silent at present. The cries of animals become more and more distinct. You don't know where they come from in the middle of this silver colored landscape. The screams propagate immensely everywhere between heaven and earth, end of quote. Hours before this dreadful event, Baumer had seen the moving beauty of these animals, which paraded noble and serene. Quote, the backs of the horses shine in the moonlight. Their movements are beautiful. They carry their heads high and you can see their eyes flaming. The cannons and holes appear to glide against the smoky break background of the lunar landscape. It is in a way beautiful and moving." End of quote. The tragic nature of animal death in the landscape contrasts with the beauty and height of the living animal which Baumer, Baumer contemplates at first. This pain, if it is that of wounded horses, is also that of Baumer who had never heard anything like it. In hearing the terrible moans of the horse, there is the materialization of the very possibility of death. And Rosaria soon to, uh, talks about this. The presence of the animal in the landscape will startle our own lives, showing us at the same time, with its danger and size, the ability to observe unpredictability, risk danger. The trauma Bomber now feels of finding in those magnificent animals now sacrificed, the mirror that is his own finitude in that sinister place so far from God. And on the left, we see some, we see a man putting a gas mask or what was supposed to be a gas mask uh, on the horses. The landscape that hides and distances itself from death is not landscape. And the landscape of war with death everywhere will be inaugurated precisely as a problematic and infinite meeting point between the man who intuits it hides in it and is saved, and the war that destroys it. The animals, in turn, in addition to their dangerousness and sublimity, reflect in the landscape what is also the human dimension of life, which we so often run away from. And this, of course, uh, this mar these are my words, but this is a conjunction of my ideas with the ideas of Rosaria Sunt, that talks about how landscape is so necessary to us. If in Ritter, landscape is a creation of the spirit, Rosaria Stunt also believes in that, but thinks that that creation is also full of natural elements, uh, actual elements that, uh, and we need them, we need them. He says, um, without the landscape, we die. Without the landscape, we will die. Quote here from Asunto, the animal and its danger is for us in the landscape a way of discovering the limited character, the precariousness of our life, but also an intensity that becomes aware of itself precisely in knowing oneself mortal, in this realizing that we are alive, even in our mortality, and that we are capable of thinking about this mortality, not realizing that we can think about our death, 
even fearing it. I'm quoting, of course, of course, Assunto in Il Paisaggio de Estetica, um, Landscape and Aesthetics from uh, 1973. War, fear, death, and landscape are thus ultimate, intimately intertwined as I defend here with these authors. And the latter is now shown at the front in a multiple chame chameleon-like dimension, which every day and every night changes in its configurations, lines, and limits. The landscape of war being so often a no man's land as in itself this unique characteristic of being other, of being foreign, the lost men who face each other there can see and feel nothing at first, but a profound horror and panic. It will be the same landscape, however, the reason for salvation for the men of war. If it will allow them to live a few minutes longer with its shelters, its land and its water where it is available. It is also a remembrance in its elements of distant landscapes. The attraction and love for nature, which Paul Baumer will notice by the shape of the landscape, was inexplicable. On one of the nights that he is alone on watch while his comrades sleep in the trenches, Baumer has what will be, in my understanding, the reflection of the category of landscape per excellence. Quote, night comes from the depths of the caves fog rises. One would say that the holes are full of mysterious ghost-like things. It's fresh. I'm on sentry duty and staring into the darkness. I feel depressed as I do after every attack. So it's hard for me to be alone with my thoughts. Strictly speaking, it is not thoughts, but memories that haunt me now in my weakness and strike me in a singular way. The luminous rockets rise in the sky and I see an image taking shape in me, a distant landscape, end of quote. Among the fields behind our town, a row of old willows rises along a stream. They could see each other from a long way off. And although they formed a single file, they called it the willow walk. Even as children, we already had a predilection for them. We spent whole days with them and listened to their slight murmur. We sat it in, in its shade on the bank of the creek with a waterfall and dipped our feet in the clear water. The pure emanations of the water and the melody of the wind in the willows dominated our imagination. We loved them so much. And the image of those days, that landscape, before it disappears, still makes my heart beat." End of quote. This memory of the landscape by the young soldier, while undeniably beautiful from a literary point of view, presents at the same time, and as in almost everything that is beautiful, an infinitely tragic tone, and which helps us to reflect on the landscape in the subject of philosophy. This image of the landscape, due to an extraordinary, extraordinary phenomenon, is very close to me, says Baumer. It almost touches me before being extinguished by the flash, by the flash of the next rocket. This fading of the familiar landscape is evoked in soldiers, uh, soldier Baumer's mind with the presentation of two poles that never exist without each other, the joy of remembrance and the sadness of remembrance. If the memory of the landscape is a happy memory, it quickly, it quickly turns into deep loneliness and heartbreak. The knowledge and awareness of that ancient nature, as Ritter would agree with, from childhood, which one know, now knows through the landscape and where one has been, uh, it becomes pain, precisely because of the knowledge of the past happy moment and the full awareness in the present of the real impossibility of becoming one to return to that nature already in Baumer, already turned into landscape. And just as in Jacob's room, we were constantly reminded of his pers uh, persistent, lethargic, mute and promise to disappear character, in Baumer's memories of childhood landscapes, similarly, similarly absolute silence reigns. Quote, it is strange that all the memories of landscapes are always full of silence, and they are mute apparitions that speak to me with looks and gestures without resorting to words silently, end of quote. Thus, also the remembered landscapes, and which Baumer knew so well, precisely because they were known, already experienced, are a reminder at the same time of the physical and natural loss of that nature, of those elements, which becomes the disappearance of the unconsciousness of youth, which lead to growth, entry into adulthood, and ultimately war. Quote, this silence of the landscapes is the reason why images from the past awaken in us less desires than sadness, 
an immense and passionate melancholy. They passed. They are part of a world that is finished for us. We belong to them, to these landscapes, and they belong to us, even if we were separated. So Baumer notices the landscape because it's already outside of, of nature. And now, trying to end this presentation, I'm now going to present a very special episode of Jacob's Room, The Rock of Ages. And we are going to return here to the moment when Jacob is with his friend, Timmy Durant, swimming near the Isles of Scilly. I know it was a long time ago, but let's go back to it. <laughs> Quote, abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the shadows deepen, Lord, with me abide. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Abide With Me is, of course, a, a famous funeral poem, and it is here sung by Jacob after a long reflection on the landscape. Help is asked, the rock of times, that it opens and closes for Jacob. The allusions to rocky elements, having already been made numerous times, are always associated with Jacob Flanders. On the beach in Cornwall, Jacob as a boy appears for the first time to the reader emerging from behind a rock, I don't know if you remember, as if it belonged to her. The belonging to this rock, I believe, never really dissipates. Jacob never separates from her. Also the nanny, the nurse of the Flanders family who uh, watches over the boys at the beginning of Virginia Woolf's book will be compared to a rock, primitive and safe. Sitting on the sand, symbol of care and the basic dimension that Jacob seems to want because he feels lost. He was lost. And here we see Jacob crying for his nanny. Nanny, nanny, he cried, sobbing the words out on the crest of each gasping breath. The waves came around her. She was a rock. She was covered with the seaweed which pops when it is pressed. And Jacob was lost. End of quote. Thus, no longer for identification, as in the beginning, Jacob emerging from the rock, nor for our protection as here with the nanny being the rock. We are now going towards a darker, um, more terrible dimension because it is difficult and of dissolution, of total, total annulment of some possible trace of individuality that the rock like God opened for Jacob for him to disappear inside the rock of ages. If there is a salvific dimension, it is a delicate and final leap. The primitive, enormous, and original character of this rock of times, if it is natural and one, it is equally and always monstrous and incomprehensible. Feeling identical to that of Jacob Flanders, we will see in All Quiet on the Western Front. In the 1929 book, Remarque, as we know, builds on the fictional character Paul Baumer what was his personal experience experienced lived in the trenches of the Western Front. A remarkable episode that, of course, will never leave the memory of the German writer that uh, will survive both world wars and will die at the age of 72 in 1970. If the book of Remarque ends with the premature and anonymous death of Baumer a few weeks after the declaration of the end of the war in the autumn of 1918, Eric Remarque, who knows the unjust fate promised to his protagonist, seems to try to continue and subtly offer another end to his young creation through the countless mentions and reflections on the landscape, which Baumer, at the end of the story, and now so close to his death, he doesn't know it, passionately desires and in total dedication. If Jacob Flanders wants the Rock of Ages to open and to swallow him, Paul Baumer wants the earth. Eat too, like the rock, a natural element so dense and primitive. Quote, and the defensive forces come to us from the earth and from the air, mainly from the earth. For no one does the land have as much importance as for the soldier. When he closes himself against her for a long time with violence, when he plunges his face and limbs deep into her in the mortal terrors of the fire, then she is his only friend, his sister, his mother. End of quote. Everything in the landscape as an object of vital, like a vital feeling, as Rosaria Sunt would describe, will enlarge our heart to the point of wanting to lose ourselves in it. 
In the landscape, there is an ever present sense of immersion in which man, and I'm gonna quote Asunto, sees himself as welcomed, hosted, included until he feels a tendency to become one with nature, end of quote. There is thus a primitive abandonment to nature the landscape as salvation, as I see it. Quote from Remark. And this is uh, already in a very late stages of the book. We lay down on the ground and our breathing makes the stems and flowers bend here and there. Seen like this very close to the ground, the pale sand is pure as a laboratory formed by a multitude of tiny grains. We are driven by an enormous desire to bury our hands there, end of quote. In Eric Maria Remarque's work, the last page of the story shows us Paul's last meditation, which will be reserved precisely for these natural elements arranged in the invisible and sensitive line of the landscape that the soldier deeply desires. The experience of the landscape in which the young Baumer encloses the whole of nature within himself in memory is indeed a certainty and now more than ever an urgency a profound and ultimate desire quote the life that carried me through these years is still present in my hands and in my eyes was i its lord i ignore it but while it's here my life it will find its way with or without this consent of this force that resides in me and says i so that human individuality that Ritter talks about. But it may be that all I think about is nothing but melancholy, things that will disappear when I am again under the willows listening to the murmur of the leaves. So he's thinking about that landscape again. The trees here are an explosion of multicolor and gold, berries reddening the middle of the foliage, very white roads lead towards the horizon, end of quote. And I'm going to end here. The experience of the landscape and in the landscape is no longer just about an aesthetic theory or a contemplative process or a compensatory simulation, but it holds in itself a salvific dimension, I think. The only one that comforts, shelters, feeds, that sustains and offers in the last resort and as in the beginning life. And I'm going to read this passage from Remarque's book. I think it's very interesting, very powerful, and very beautiful. Baumer says, earth, 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 with your earthly rages, your holes and your depths, where we can flatten and crouch, whole earth, dirt in the convulsions of horror, when destruction breaks loose and in the death halls of the explosions, it is you who give us the mighty countercurrent of slave life. The terrified commotion of our tattered existence finds a vital energy that has passed from you into our hands, so that if we escape death, we scrutinize your entrails, and in the mute and anguished happiness of having escaped this minute, we bite you greedily. And uh, I believe that's it. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you. <laughs>